I'm Graham Smith from the University of Sydney and the Australian National University and today it's my great privilege to introduce Professor Ezra Vogel from Harvard University. Ezra, welcome. Thank you. I guess um, as history being history, it's just one damn thing after another, um, maybe we can start with Deng's very early life. Sure. Uh, so to borrow a phrase from the Jesuits, give me the boy at eight and I give you the man. Could you give us a brief thumbnail sketch of, of Deng Xiaoping at eight years old? He had started the Confucian Academy in his own uh, little town. Uh, he was uh, known as being very bright, wonderful memory. Uh, but about eight, he got into regular public schools. It was just the turn of the uh, China. He, he was born in 1904, it's 1911 revolution. So the year after the Chinese uh, revolution. And he was already thinking about what's going to happen in China in the future. His father first wanted to educate him to be an official, but then the dynasty collapsed. So how do they get ready for the new age? And he went to schools that were struggling to introduce new Western subjects in arithmetic and history. Uh, but he was uh, very bright, very determined. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. And his relationship to his parents, how would you you'd characterize that? He had a very uh, distant relationship with his father. His father was away a lot. Uh, his father was a small landlord, and uh, his grandfather had worked very hard to build up the family farm. But the father w uh, spent most of his time in the town and the city and took part in activities beyond there. Um, he apparently was a gambler, uh, but he was also uh, a person who had a little restaurant and helped support the school. He believed in education uh, for the son, and uh, he wanted to get him as well educated as he could. And when they were uh, get, getting to, uh, done to the high school age, the father heard about school in France that he might go to and arranged that he should take an exam for a preparatory school to go abroad uh, that set him up for international education age 16. Mm -hmm. So the father took great interest in his education, but then tried to set him up with a local marriage, and Dung would have none of that. Uh, he wanted to choose his own bride, thank you. Uh, and by the time he got to France, he wanted a revolutionary wife. Mm -hmm. And so he never again visited his hometown. And part of it, I think, was a way of saying to the Chinese people, look, I'm not going to have any special favors for my family or my hometown. I'm Chinese, and I'm thinking that country as a whole. Mm -hmm. But it's quite remarkable that uh, when he left for France, he never saw his parents again. Exactly. He never attended their funerals. Uh, exactly. Well, his mother uh, died when she was 43, quite a young age. But it's true, he, even when he was in Sichuan, uh, back there in 1949 and 52, his home province. Uh, he didn't go back to his home village. Uh, as I say, he wanted to make the statement, he's thinking of China as a whole. Uh, China is a place where a lot of people look after their friends and relatives, and uh, he was going to determine not to do that. Mm. And it would, be, would it be fair to say in some way that the party became his, his family? Oh, absolutely. The party... Uh, and uh, the, his friends in the party uh, became a band. I mean, it happened to Dung when he was about 18, 19 years old, uh, and he never looked back. He, he was one of the first thousand members of the Communist Party. He joined while he was in France, and a group of other uh, people joined the party. Uh, and uh, they were very dedicated revolutionary. Now, of course, the party has almost 80 million people. Uh, but at the time it was less than a thousand. He was one of the earliest members, uh, and that was his center of his life uh, until he passed away. And you describe Young Deng as, as precocious, and it's it's remarkable reading your book, uh, the early sections of it, to hear that at the age of 15 he participated in the May 4th movement. Exactly. And at the age of 16 he goes off to France by himself. Exactly. At 15, uh, after World War I, they had the first big patriotic demonstrations, as you know. And Dung was in a, in a high school, but he was on the streets. And at that time, he was just an absolute, uh, absolutely committed to the, the nation and nationalism. 
and China wasn't doing very well. They were angry at all the countries that had uh, impeached upon Chinese territory. And he was just determined to fight back against that. And as you say, off to France at 16. So he was away from his family. And as you say, the, the party and the cause of Chinese nationalism uh, became his home. And you say early in his life he was very witty. He was a very funny man. Or yes. Fun-loving fun is, yes. is your exact yes. phrase. Yes. Um, could, could you give us some example of his wit? Because it's, it's, it's hard to see that in the later Dong, I guess. Well, um, when he was a little kid, uh, he played on the arch. Uh, there's a memorial arch at the entrance of his village, and uh, nobody was supposed to run around on that. He jumped around on it and played and was told not to, and he still continued doing that. When he met uh, Shirley MacLaine uh, uh, at a White House dinner, uh, she told him about an intellectual during the Great Revolution had gone down to plant tomatoes and what a wonderful thing it was. He worked, so this intellectual learned so much and Dung got a little impatient after a while uh, and uh, he said he was lying and uh, <laughs> that uh, the Cultural Revolution was awful. Um, when he was um, uh, visited by the Hong Kong governor for the first time, uh, at the end of the speech, the Hong Kong government was telling him all about the problems of Hong Kong. Uh, Dung, who was a little less than five feet tall, called uh, Murray Maclehose, who was over six feet tall. He beckoned with his little finger and, and Maclehose bent down over Dung. And uh, Dung says, if you think Hong Kong, governing Hong Kong is hard, you should try governing China. Uh, so it was that kind of sort of quick repartee. Mm. Uh, and when Zbig Brzezinski, uh, at the first uh, White House dinner in Washington, uh, said to him, uh, you know, we had problems politically in normalizing relations with China. Uh, did you have any problems, political problems, in normalizing relations with the United States? And Deng said, oh yes, uh, the province of Taiwan was very reluctant. <laughs> <laughs> So he retained his wit in a way. Um, oh, yes. You, you point to a certain point in his life where he did undergo something of a, a personality shift, um, which was marked by the death of his first wife. Could you tell us a bit about that? Well, uh, this is what his daughter uh, tells me, and uh, she was with him during the several years when he was down the countryside, mm -hmm. culture revolutions, and she, she was his, uh, uh, with him in his old age as he went out to the public. Uh, and uh, she said that uh, he was known as witty and fun-loving when he was a kid, but when his first wife uh, died in childbirth in Shanghai, about the same time he was thrown out of the, out of the office, as the first time he was purged and he didn't know they would live or die, and you know, there were a lot of people being shot in those days, uh, and uh, he really didn't know. And, uh, what was going to happen to him. And between those two things, he became much more serious and sober. Um, he, within six months or so, he was reinstated and given a new job. But it left him a much more sober, serious person uh, after that. that. That occurred in the early 1930s. And I guess another crucial relationship Deng had in the 1930s with, was with Mao. Um, hmm. Could you outline, I guess, the early dynamics of their relationship and how, in a way, that helped uh, Deng later in his career to be one of the few, uh, well, one of the very few of Mao, Mao's lieutenants to survive. When Deng was only 25 years old, he was sent out to lead urban insurrections in the province of Guangxi, and he worked like hell for a year, uh, and he lied with local military people, and the problem of getting food for the soldiers and defending against the opposition and setting up a base and getting the uh, support of local farmers. Uh, he did quite a bit, but in the end, it just collapsed completely. And then he was sent to Jiangxi, where Mao had done the same thing, only successful. And Mao was several years older than Deng. And here was a guy who had done all those things that Deng had failed at, and Mao had succeeded. And Mao just worshipped him. I mean, this guy, uh, Deng just worshipped Mao, that he'd done so much. Uh, and then all during 
the period of the fight against the Japanese and the Civil War, Mao seemed to go from one victory after another and seemed to have a sense of strategy and unify the country. And Deng was ready to follow him. He was ready to follow him early in the 50s. And it's also true that Deng supported him when they criticized a lot of intellectuals uh, and threw them out. He supported him in the early part of the Great Leap Forward. But I think then something happened and he felt it had gone too far. And what Mao was doing in the culture of, in the uh, Great Leap Forward it was destroying too many people. And Mao was so powerful he couldn't oppose him, but he could distance himself and in his own sector try to create some space where he could do what you needed to do to help China. So uh, it's a case of Mao was just so powerful, just so overwhelming, such a large godlike figure who controlled the party. It was just too much. And I think in the end, after the Great Leap Forward, when Mao criticized Deng, Deng had had enough. And even though he never expressed his open opposition to Mao, uh, when his son you know, broke his back escaping from the Red Guards, uh, and when he himself uh, spent seven years uh, out of power, uh, he had had enough. But he knew yet that uh, if he criticized Mao too much, it would destroy the authority of the party. And therefore, he tried to find a formula that said uh, Mao did a great thing to unify the country. He just made some mistakes in his later, later life. Uh, so the party people who love Mao could still feel that Deng was loyal, but he gave space to depart completely from Mao's strategy. And, and Deng himself did accept a, a good deal of the blame. Um, I mean, he famously said, we are all to blame when asked whether it should be placed on Mao. Well, I think the other party leaders knew that Deng was one of the big people pushing the Great Leap Forward. Mm. Uh, they knew that he was responsible uh, and that he, if anything, had pushed harder than a lot of the others. And uh, therefore, it was perhaps a little disarming uh, when people say, well, Mao did this, Mao did it. And Deng said, we are all to blame. Yeah. It wasn't just Mao. Indeed. And in the particular case of the Great Leap Forward, um, a lot of research coming out now is suggesting it wasn't perhaps as sudden as we were all led to believe. The problems were actually building up way back in 1954. Yes. And at that stage, Deng was finance minister. So right. So he, he does. Oh, he bears responsibility, and he supported completely the, or the beginnings of the Great Leap Forward. Mm. Yeah. Another, I guess, aspect in your book that uh, isn't brought out, um, and I'd be interested to know from your extensive interviews, how Deng felt about his role in the, the anti-rightist campaign, which was in, in many ways as tragic as the Great Leap Forward for China's future. One of the problems of doing research in him is that because he took part in the underground very young, he never left, left notes. He learned that he had to be secret. So one has to observe what he did and how he behaved. At the anti-rightist campaign, where over 500,000 intellectuals were dis you know, criticized, a lot of them destroyed, careers destroyed. When he came back later in 1975 uh, to a responsible position, one of the first things he did was send Hu Yaobang out to work with scientists and try to win them back. And later what he did say was, and we made some mistakes in the, in the, in the anti-rightist campaign. Uh, some intellectuals thought they never should have had the campaign. Deng still maintained they should have had the campaign, but he said we uh, enlarged the targets way too much. And then he mentioned about half a dozen people who deserve to be criticized, but basically all the rightists were uh, freed at a later time. Mm -hmm. So I think he realized that uh, destroying the intellectuals meant that you didn't have the intellectual support that's necessary for modernizing the country. He was a pragmatic man who wanted to do what was necessary to make things work. He realized he needed the support of the intellectuals. So uh, in 1975, he really tried to do what he could to make it up to them. But in a way, there were two missed decades, I guess. Um, if you look at a couple of specific areas, uh, for example, not doing anything on family planning for two decades or protecting vernacular architecture, these, in a way, could be seen as fallouts of the anti rightist campaign. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it was. Uh, and, and because the anti rightist campaign 
uh, the intellectuals were not there to object to the Great Leap Forward. So they were making huge errors in the Great Leap Forward. The intellectuals had been destroyed and they would have been outspoken critics. So by destroying the opposition first, Mao could charge ahead with the Great Leap Forward and made those huge errors. Uh, Deng, as a loyal supporter at that time, uh, was behind Mao. And Deng, of course, isn't the only East Asian leader you've looked at. You've uh, looked yes. at Korean leaders and Japanese leaders. Right, right. Um, how, where do you see him in relation to them? Um, are there a lot of similarities <coughs> that you came across? I think Deng, in a way, was a greater leader than any of those others that I've come across, in the sense that he took such a huge country that was in such a mess and completely transformed it in the period of 78 to 92 when he was in charge. Um, uh, Park Chun Hee in, in, North, in South Korea turned that country around. He was like a military dictator uh, and got the economy going. But he didn't really build up entirely new institutions. He didn't completely transform an entire party. And he wasn't dealing on the big stage of a country the size of China. Uh, there was no Japanese leader who really played a major role. It was kind of a group of people under the American occupation that led to the takeoff. Um, and so uh, I think, and compared to Jiang Kai-shek and Jiang Jingwu in Taiwan, uh, things were introduced gradually. Uh, but Deng, uh, you know, for a huge country that was really starving, much worse shape than any of those places, uh, to turn a revolutionary party into a party that was directing a country toward modernization uh, it was really an extraordinary achievement. Mm. I guess looking now at his, his, mm -hmm. his legacy, uh -huh. um, do you think he managed to transform the party and the economic system as, as much as he would have liked to? I think he would have wanted more political reform. He wrote very early that in order to take, we need political reform, it needs to change as the economy changes. but. Uh, how much you do depends on the support of the people and the political conditions. If conditions are too unstable, then you cannot make those political reforms. And at several times he was starting to make some political reforms. He did make some. I mean, there was a lot more freedom under his period than there w had been before. Uh, there was also regular meetings of the party uh, <clears throat> and regular assignments. It was a kind of a... a, a the kind of a, a tight organization that he introduced. But for increasing freedoms, uh, he talked about it in 1980, he talked about it in 1986, but then student movements came along again, there was instability, and having seen an unstable country for 150 years, he felt that you had to clamp down. Uh, you had to keep order during that period. And so the political reform was postponed. I think if he were alive today, he would still be in support of more for political reform. And one of the consequences of the um, Tiananmen massacre was um, the state's response to finding a new glue, if you like, for the nation. And it was at that point um, where nationalism and patriotism absolutely came exactly to be right. Emphasized. Exactly. How, how do you think Deng felt about that, given it wasn't something he'd really drawn upon throughout his long career? Well, I think he had always been a nationalist from the time he demonstrated in the May 4th movement in 1919. But uh, Mao had emphasized class struggle. And I think by the time he came, Deng came to power in 78, he was no longer pushing class struggle, but he was pushing modernization. But then when the socialism collapsed everywhere uh, and they were worried after, May, uh, after June 4th, 19, 1989, the students were going to be all lost and uh, against the government. He tried to find a way to get the students to support the government. If he had said socialism when it was collapsing in Eastern Europe and, and the Soviet Union, that probably wouldn't have rallied the youth. And so he then drew upon the one card that the Chinese leaders had, that is nationalism, the loyalty to the Chinese nation. So he began this... Uh, patriotic education campaign in the early 90s to emphasize the Chineseness, the importance of our country. Mm. 
And in some ways, the challenges faced today aren't that dissimilar to the challenges of the 1980s when you look at what popular dissatisfaction is about. But the question, I guess, is, is there a leader who can emerge, who can play a similar role to Deng Xiaoping? Um, I recall last year when you were interviewed by Orville Schell, you mentioned the possibility that, that Bo Xilai or someone like him <laughs> might be able to play <laughs> such a role. It didn't quite pan out, but uh, um, yeah. how, do, how do you see it? Can collective leadership um, solve the problems, I guess? It's hard to imagine that anybody could emerge as strong as Deng now. Uh, he was, after all, an early revolutionary leader. He was a military hero. He was at the Huaihai campaign and emerged as a front uh, political commissar of half a million people and troops in one of the most critical battles of the war. Uh, so a military hero who was in the military for 12 years, uh, who had worked closely with the founders, Mao and Zhou Enlai. Uh, there's nobody like that who has a nor is the country now in the formative period where whole new institutions can be built. Uh, the, the new situation is that the leader merges within the organization in a structure that was really laid down by Deng. So you can't have that big of an individual leader. But I think you, your point is right, that as a collective leadership, the, the party still has a great deal of power. And I think the new leadership after the 18th Party Congress will be under a lot of pressure to expand the realm of freedom, uh, to uh, deal uh, more openly with the June 4th, 1989 incident, and to attack corruption. And <clears throat> I think we can expect uh, the collective leadership after the 18th Party Congress to work hard on that. There's a lot of dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction in China, not a rumbling, a lot of the same conditions, uh, as you say, that led to the June 4th uh, demonstrations. And uh, the leaders have a, a big task. I don't envy the, the problem that these leaders have uh, facing such a huge country with so much doubt about the leadership through corruption. In, in a sense, one of the things that comes through in your book is you talk about him as a builder of of institutions. Right. Um, what China faces now is the problem of how to reform the existing exactly. institutions. Are there any examples from Deng's leadership that suggest a way forward? I think uh, one thing is that Deng did not attack the conservatives. He tried to do things in such a way that would bring the whole country. And he tried to find ways uh, to uh, keep the unity together. And for example, when he destroyed the collectivization, got rid of the communes, if he had said, we're going to get rid of communes, people would have been up in arms. What he said was, in local areas where starvation is so rampant, we have to let the local people find some way to avoid starvation. And then when some of them started doing their own individual farms instead of collectives, he sends down reporters to report back what they found. And they found that uh, uh, grain supplies were going way up, harvests were going way up. And when those harvests went way up, then he uh, says, well, all over the country where people judge the local conditions are such, they should be allowed to adapt uh, the system. And about ni over 90% of the, uh, the communes were out of business within a year. Uh, and the production teams were out. And you had what they called uh, contracting down to the household, which is essentially individual farming. So it's that way of getting around to resistance. Uh, but I think that they're going to have to take some very tough measures uh, to get rid of corruption. Uh, showing a lot of cases and punish a few cases probably won't be enough. I think it's going to be hard to get public support unless they announce within a certain period of time that the leaders have to announce how much wealth their family has and where the family wealth is located. I think it's going to be very, it's going to be a very tough problem, but I think they're going to have to go that far. Mm -hmm. And part of the genius, I guess, of Deng Xiaoping is even whilst he defended the interests of the party, a lot of the economic success in the 1980s and 1990s was built upon he, um, his own actions in persuading the party state to get out of the way of ordinary people and allow them to be entrepreneurial. 
But in recent years, you've seen a rather different trend, the, the guojinmintui, the yes. idea that the state is now yes. entering into or competing against private business. Um, how could that be rolled back, given the sheer size of the state? And how the, I think they're already there trying now. They're trying to say the society should be given more leeway and the uh, enterprises should be given more leeway. Uh, it's a tough thing because you've got the interests of the local officials who are to... Uh, so can the higher-ups in Beijing you know, provide enough cover and uh, be tough on enough regional leaders so that the rest of the regional leaders will allow more of the power to shift to private groups? But they're now, as you know, they're now experimenting in certain areas. And I think it's going to happen. I, th I think there will be increasing effort to uh, pass on to something like NGOs more of the uh, responsibility for local society and not just have it centralized in the party. And you went back and forth to China in the course of your research yes. and met with ordinary Chinese people as well, your previous students and friends. Right. What do they think of Deng Xiaoping these days? How is he viewed in China now? <coughs> I think there's a split. I think there are some intellectuals who feel he was such a strong leader, he had an opportunity to make the country more democratic. He was too cautious, he should have done a lot more. And that he clamped down on June 4th, and that's unforgivable, that shooting people in the streets of Beijing. And that uh, we need to move very fast uh, in a more democratic party. But if you say, who did more to increase the uh, modernization of China and to make your life better, who was the man most responsible? The answer is Deng. But I think that a lot of the intellectuals feel he didn't go far enough and that he should have gone further. I think there's a recognition now that Mao really was a nasty person uh, and did some horrible things. I think there's more sympathy with Deng. Uh, he didn't go far enough, but he was not a bad guy. He was not out to punish people. He was not an arbitrary person. He was trying to build a country, but he, and, but he didn't go far enough. Well, one thing I found curious among some of my friends is uh, some people are starting to look back to the good old days of Jiang Zemin, <laughs> which really I never thought I would see. <laughs> and in that sense, I perhaps Deng isn't always getting the credit for what he started. Oh, I, th I think though that the majority would say, if you say what one person is responsible for modernization mm. and for opening uh, universities and, and expanding them and sending people abroad, <coughs> I think Dung gets the most of the credit. There's another mood, of course, and that's a nostalgia for the good old days of Mao when we were equal and people were not so selfish and not so much out for, Ma for money. And I think that that kind of nostalgia is there. But, you know, when Duncan came to power, the average per capita, was, per capita income was $100. And if you said at the end of that nostalgia, uh, would you rather live back in those old days? Would you rather have your television sets and your uh, cars and your bicycles? And uh, they would take now. And I think there is a, there's a recognition that for all the problems of corruption, Life is a hell of a lot better now than it was 30 years ago. For sure, but inequality is always a relative thing. And uh, I think a lot of the people in the countryside who are poor uh, recognize that if their own lives gets better year by year, it doesn't matter that much if somebody on the coast is getting a little more than you are. But when some people are getting to be billionaires and flaunt their wealth with lavish, nouveau riche displays, uh, that's too much. And, and when certain high officials' families are flaunting their wealth and making the money off the people around them, that's too much. So I think what really aggravates them is not simply the inequality, but the lavish display of wealth and the way it's acquired. One thing that comes through in your book which fascinates mm -hmm. me is that mm -hmm. here is a man who you portray as extremely confident in his yes. own skin yes. from a very early age. So yes. he writes an autobiography of himself at the age of 22 and all throughout his career he often takes actions 
even though, um, say for example, the uh, let's teach Vietnam a lesson, yes. even though he's being told by his generals, maybe not such a good idea, he still pushes ahead and has the confidence in his own beliefs to push ahead. Where did this confidence come from? Well, I, I think it came uh, partly because he's bright, but it also came from a lot of study and a lot of thought. <clears throat> when I talked to, for example, his interpreter on the way to the United States, uh, Tung was sitting and thinking, and he operated without notes, and he wanted to prepare for all those. He also had three and a half years in the countryside during the Cultural Revolution, when he had a chance to think about what he's going to do uh, when he comes back to power. He had so much experience in leadership in every important sector in the military, in local government, uh, in the party center, uh, in the finance ministry. He had such a broad range of experience, and he had seen uh, the West uh, in France in the 20s, he'd seen China at all these stages. Uh, he was a, a sharp observer. Uh, he had gotten good briefings, a lot of information uh, over the years, and he always had two or three lines of reporting. Uh, so he had, every morning uh, he read. He he didn't uh, get his information by talking with people. He, he wanted, his hearing wasn't good in his later days, but he wanted to read reports from all kinds of people. And he wanted the whole stack of them, and he would choose which reports to read and which, he wanted all the whole stack of the newspapers to see, and he would pick articles he read. So by thinking and his experience, and by being just bright, working closely with Mao and Zhou, I think he, he acquired knowledge that, and uh, kind of experience and perspective that nobody else had at that time. So I think that's what underlay his confidence. Yeah. Professor Gogol, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Thank you, it's been an absolute pleasure. Well, same here. Uh, you've done a lot of homework, and I appreciate talking to you. Thank, Thank you. you.